And first, the evolution of the internet. Has any one of you an idea who <coughs> invented the internet as we know it nowadays, or where it has been developed? The US and Army. for which reasons? Marijn? The US Army, I think. The US Army, that's correct. And why? Because in general, especially in uh, applied research, there is a cause. Why was the US government or the US Army so eager to construct something like the internet? Did they not have telephones yet? Yes, but yes. the data could they transfer data over these telephone lines by that moment? I guess you can talk in that in the way it's data, not, not, not data like the like no, They used other protocols, but they could transfer data. That was not the big issue. Not with the same speed as we know it nowadays, but I mean they could send over data Remember, for example, the code 1110110, yeah, long, long, short, that's data. That's data, actually. And on the other end, someone is transferring it into human language again. <coughs> so there was a telephone, there was a telegraph. What more was there on the political level during the 70s, so the decade before you were born, it's known as the nobody of the 70s here, that's for sure. How is the period called? Everyone will give you the right answer. If you ask someone who was born in the 60s or 50s, or 50s and you ask them, how was it called, that period, and 60s, 70s? Hippies. Excuse me? Hippies. No, that's the end of the 60s. Uh, Cold War. The Cold War, yes. That was setting the mindset all over the world. When will the nuclear war between Russia and the US start? That was the key question of the moment. And if it starts one day, how can we defend ourselves against it? And that was what the US Army and the US government was worrying about all the time, day in, day out. And they came to a quite logical conclusion that what we should avoid is that when a nuclear war starts, that communication between different cities, between different zones, between different bases is interrupted. That will be even more killing than the nuclear bomb, bomb that could be dropped. An interruption in communication between, for example, East Coast and West Coast. Now by then, there were only wires from one city to another. And if you could hit one city in the middle, then probably all communication would be interrupted between one side and the other. And that's what they wanted to avoid. How can we set up a network where the non-hit cities, the one that is hit, will be destroyed? That's for sure. Definitely in case of a nuclear war. But how can we avoid that all the other spots will still be able to communicate with each other? Although, before the bomb, there were passing by messages over that hit city, and afterwards they could not do that anymore. That was the key question. How can we set up such kind of network? For example, imagine West Coast, California, San Francisco is communicating with New York, East Coast and all the messages are passing by or by Miami or by Las Vegas or by Houston or by Detroit. I take some cities in the middle now. Let's say that San Francisco was all the time communicating to New York pushing through the messages to Detroit. And then all of a sudden, Detroit is destroyed. 
So that path can no longer be followed. What the Americans wanted to have is a smart digital postman that would automatically look for another route. How to get this message from San Francisco to New York? Because it entered the Detroit area, could not continue because the whole area is destructed, is uh, dest uh, destroyed, and then should be intelligent enough to look for another path to end up finally in New York. That's actually what they were looking for. And then they came up with a new protocol, which is actually the TCP protocol. And that is still nowadays the basis for the internet. And the TCP protocol makes it possible to hand over a message to the internet. For example, from this laptop, I write an email, I hand it over to the internet. In the email header is stated where it comes from and where it has to go to. And then I do not have to worry anymore. Sooner or later, the sooner the better of course. Sometimes there might be delay. But the internet itself is intelligent enough to deliver that message at the other end. Even if the path is not predefined. And that's the big difference between the old networks and the new networks. In the old networks, keep this in mind, you had predefined paths. The predefined path from San Francisco to New York was via Detroit. Detroit is destroyed, no communication any longer between San Francisco and New York. In the new network, the internet network, there is not such thing as a predefined path. The only thing you tell the network is this is a message that leaves San Francisco and this message has to go to New York. Find out yourself what path to use. That's actually what you do. And now I gave you the example of an email, but it can be something you write or post on a, on a website, on Facebook for example. It can be a video that you upload, it can be a video that you download. In that case, it's a message that comes to you. But you do not have to worry, and it's even out of your control, which path that video will follow. Sometimes it might reach you via the shortest line. For example, the shortest line from Amsterdam to Paris passes by Brussels. But it might be because of a congestion at a certain moment in Brussels that it automatically passes by Berlin or even by Beijing. You will even not notice. That's the intelligence of the TCPIP protocol. That was all invented in that first phase. Then, once it was adopted by the US Army and thoroughly tested, it got adopted by big institutions, like uh, governmental institutions and universities. And afterwards, in the last phase, it was commercialized. At the beginning, by telecom companies in America, and afterwards, by all kinds of ICT companies all over the world. Do you have questions about this history in a nutshell about the innovation or the invention of the internet? Keep in mind that it's very important that the communication paths are not predefined. I can send a message from myself to Marijn passing by any of the nodes sitting over there. It's not predefined, I do not know which node will be available by that time, but I'm sure, definitely right now, since there are billions of nodes available in the internet today, that somehow it will arrive. A very simple or very simplified drawing of that network looks like this. You have a sender, that could be you, 
that can be <coughs> a person of flesh and blood, that can be a computer as well. There are thousands of computers who are sending out messages and videos automatically on a or hourly basis. In the message is always the to and the from. And the to and the from are unique. I get back to this later. And then it's handed over to the internet. And it's passing by lots of rotors who try to find the most convenient path of the moment. And as soon as the total message has been arrived at the recipient, the recipient will send a small message back telling the sender everything arrived in good order and then the process is closed. Now, such a message at the very beginning could be sent in one package if it was just a word. If it was just one word like hello in size, in bytes and bits, it's not too big, it was possible to send it as one word over the wires, nowadays wirelessly, by that time not, to the recipient. One envelope, one letter in it. But the same technology cannot be used for sending over a PDF that contains the whole book here. And definitely not a PDF that contains not only the text but even the images. Or maybe even the videos. It's way too big. It's like a, a tube, like a water hose, and you have to push through the water hose a bucket full of water. How are you going to do that? You have a water hose, I hand over the water hose one end to Lisa, one end is here, and I have to pass a bucket full of water, that's my message. To Lisa. How am I going to do that? All at once? Or will there be a big loss? Come on, this is a very physical example. How are you going to do that? Slowly. Slowly? Yeah. That's one idea. Very, very slowly. Very, very carefully. What else can you do? Just see yourself. That one big bucket here. One water hose, one pipe. You know where the destination is. You only have to put the message through. The water is representing the message here. <coughs> what do you think? Smaller mouse or a bigger hose? A bigger hose, yeah, or that could be a hose as big as the top of the bucket. Yeah. And that's what we did with the big cables beneath the sea. That's actually the internet highway. But it always gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So they opted for bigger hoses, wider hoses and smaller parts one after the other. And what you do is you take a can, you take First can of water, you put it in the hose, the second one, the third one, fourth one, and so on, until your bucket is empty. And these are the packets. What I call cans now, cans of water, are the packets on the internet. So that video clip, or that image, or the text block, is cut into pieces, is chopped up into little chunks that can be pushed through that hose. They all have a number, and how does it look like? A message from, sorry I forgot your name? Taras. Taras, yeah. From Taras to uh, Sander, to Sander from Taras, and then, which is not uh, written here, there is a number, package 1 of 5000, package 2 of 5000, package 3 of 5000, and all these packages are handed over to the internet. And they all arrive here, and very often not in the same order. Sometimes the recipient has to wait a little bit. For example, for package 3715, is delayed for one reason or the other. Just 
small milliseconds. When the recipient has received all the packages in good order, it starts reordering it and you get the video clip or the message. And that's how the internet works. Now, I said I get back to one thing, the ID. You cannot be unknown on the internet. I would like to go back one slide. Nowhere, actually, in these phases, there was a focus on security. Security is something that has been applied later on, on top of the existing infrastructure. And that's why, still nowadays, it's quite vulnerable. Because security is, has never been embedded into the infrastructure itself. It's like you have a wooden door and you want to make it secure and you are going to apply steel plates to the wooden door. But still that wooden door with steel plates will be less secure than a steel door. You understand? The internet has never been developed as a steel door. It was a very open network and afterwards security was applied to it. Now, you are known, you need an address, and that is the IP, uh, the, the I stands for internet address. The internet address is what we call the IP address, and that's something you have heard of before. It's a long number, with four parts, and that's actually the to and the from. There will not be written to Tadas or to Sander, but the IP address of Sander or Tadas, and from the same. But without IP address, without an identity, you cannot use the internet. Now you would say before, so what? It's just a number. And if one number is looking up information from a server with another number, it can be perfectly traced which number has looked up which information. And that number at the beginning was not connected at all to a person. Because even for me, when I was starting to work with the internet about 20, 25 years ago, I was sharing a computer with hundreds of students at the University of Leuven. So you could do whatever you wanted on the computer, it was never, never clear who looked up which information. But nowadays, especially with the phones, they are very personalized. And actually the number that is used by a phone is pretty sure that all the information that arrived to that number that is connected to your phone actually was your information, was requested by you. And that makes the different internet nowadays with the mobile personal devices much more different than the internet at the very beginning where internet actually or internet devices were shared by hundreds of people and you cannot go to the internet without an ID in most cases of course your own ID if you have less good intentions people try to use someone else's ID but you cannot make use of the inf uh, internet infrastructure without an ID. Questions so far? You're so quiet. Just wait until the hour is over. <laughs> yeah, I have a question. You hear quite a lot right now that there are countries and, and I think like Brazil is really leading in that, that they want to find an alternative or looking for an alternative with the internet, avoiding the United States having so much control of the internet because the, the United States has control of all the IPs, they, they have the power over that. Do, do you think that's even possible? No, it's, from a technological point of view it's not impossible at all. There's one country in the world that is having a completely alternative system up and running. And that's 
not Brazil. I would say either Russia or North China. China is having an alternative internet up and running. If the internet is shut down by the Americans in New York, they can just go on with all the people that are connected, of course, which will be only Chinese institutions, to that Chinese version of the internet. Because, indeed, the US is still having the power of shutting down the internet. Because on top of all these routers, the whole hierarchy of uh, routers and backbones, there is one, you could say, in New York, that is the police officer that is directing the traffic on the internet. And if they shut down the police officer, nobody of this digital postman know anymore where to go. So all these postmen, they will be biking around on the internet and they will stand still. Because they don't know where to go anymore. They don't know anymore which number is where. And that's why there's a huge discussion going on um, in the United Nations that the control over that power button of the internet should be handed over from the United States to the United Nations. So that the United Nations would be in control of the power on or power off button of the internet. And that's an ongoing discussion. But since the United States refuses to hand over that control, China decided to set up its own internet version. And maybe other companies or other countries could follow. What they do is using more or less the same technology, but within their own borders. Other questions or remarks, ladies? Well, I just said that it would be pretty good if the, the power <coughs> would spread and not only laying in some US hands. Because without the internet, we could do nothing. And if it would be spread, some other people may also have a clue what to do when the internet breaks mm -hmm. down. That might be a good idea, but you say you can turn it off in case of whatever need. Uh, but you have to be three at least to turn off. It's like nuclear warheads work. I mean, most nuclear rockets are secured in that way. You can launch the rocket if three independent people key in a password. That you could do as well with the internet. You say, okay, three countries, maybe not always the same one. Maybe the countries that are having a seat by then in the Security Council, or ten countries. If they all together decide we have to turn it off, they can do it, but not one single country can do it. From a technological point of view, you can apply that solution. Is that what the US will be in favor of? I doubt. Because they will be the one that loses control and power. Why should we turn off the internet? Imagine that there are situations in nuclear power plants, for example, where things can spiral out of control. That due to information that is arriving there over the internet channels causes a heating in the nuclear power plants that cannot be controlled, cannot be stopped. And the only thing you can do is just power off everything. Can imagine. I'm not saying that it's going to happen tomorrow, but I can imagine that such kind of things might uh, only be solved by temporarily shutting off everything. The hourglass of the internet. Actually, I already explained to you this bit. The cables, that's what we don't see. Most of them are underground or even under the sea. We call it the transport layers. It's there where the bits and the bytes travel around. On top of that, and that's all internet, 
especially on the top where you see web browsers, there are the applications that we use. There is our Facebook, there is our Safari, uh, Safari browser, there, there is our email client, there is our Spotify and so on. But all these different applications, that's what you have to keep in mind, be it Facebook, be it Spotify, be it the database, they all use the same layer one. They all use the same satellite connections, they all use the same um, uh, wires. And they all use the TCP IP protocol. To transfer a file on Spotify, a song, to you, you will have to choose which song you want to play on top there in your Spotify application and then it will be sent to you via one of these cables or wireless connections. How does such a network look like? This is again a very simplified version of an internet network but it gives you an idea. You have some backbones on top. These are the big connections between continents or between big regions. They are connected to subnetworks and each subnetwork can have another subnetwork and another subnetwork and a subnet and a subnet and a subnet and a subnet and so on. Even at home you can make one or more subnets. That's what people sometimes are even not aware of it, but that they have some subnetworks at home. Many people now have two networks at home. One for the visitors, one for their own use. Who knows this? If the wireless internet is installed at your place nowadays, very often you get two passwords, one for the visitors you can hand it over, one that you can use yourself. What's the difference? The visitors in general can only serve the internet, that's it. And the others with the home password can even connect directly to each other's computers or phones or whatever. You can do that directly, for example, also on your laptop. Yeah. You have like the guest entry. Yeah, the guest they entry. They can only that's connect it. to the internet. Yeah. But I know a few people that have like two different networks, one for children. For example, children, yeah. and one for themselves. Yeah. Um, they have like different safety. Yeah, you can do that. You can say the children computers they are on one network yeah. with one security shell, and then the parents' computers are on the other. Yeah. And then the children they grow up, and the smarter they get, they turn it around. <laughs> they give themselves all access, and they reduce the access that the parents have to their own computers. It really happens. Huh? I know from friends. That you believe as a parent when they were 10 that you set up a very secure network at home and by the time that they are 16 you are, you are not aware that they turned around everything and you, <laughs> you were not knowing it. Um, domains are very important because I told you the internet works with numbers. That's still true with these long numbers, IP addresses, but it's very hard to memorize for people and that's why Domain names have been invented, like facebook.com or hz.nl, but behind there's a number. It is much more easy for advertising, for promotion, or for memorizing to have a domain name instead of an IP number. And then you have the domain name service. They do nothing else than just linking numbers with the domain names. Campus network could be the HZ, you are under hz.nl, you have your mail account, you can receive and send mails, you can do a lot of other things. If you want to connect to someone else at home, for example, it goes via a lot of uh, other subnetworks in a certain hierarchy and ends up here. And the local ISP is a local internet service provider. In Zealandnet is, for example, the most known one here in Zeeland and here you have all these homes that are connected to Zeeland. If someone from Zeeland wants to send a message to someone from Amsterdam, it passes by the local ISPs, the local ISP of Zeeland, probably Zeelandnet and one of the local ISPs in Amsterdam. 
And so everything is connected to everything else. More or less on a geographical basis. That's why they call it here regional host as well. The M stands for metropolitan. And you see huge top networks around regions and around metropolitans. The Internet 2 project, and maybe we are ready for the Internet 3 project. Speed is one thing that is key. Doing the things really in real time, transferring information in real time, and it goes further than just having a conference meeting. And applying these possibilities for a better collaboration. And that's what you see nowadays more and more. And that will be really the success or the failure of a company if you succeed in applying the collaborative potential that the internet is giving you nowadays. If you are not afraid, if employees are going to use all these new technologies for collaborating because it starts with playing. And it's very difficult for companies very, uh, very often. It starts with playing on the Facebook but it can up in really not tight collaboration via the same network. Now collaboration is very popular in the health for example. And I saw a picture yesterday that uh, there was a, a hologram of a heart that could be manipulated by a surgeon, uh, a doctor, on distance. So that the patient is in Amsterdam, the doctor can touch a hologram of that patient's heart in New York and can manipulate by that way over the internet, because it's the same layer that is used, the instruments that are available in Amsterdam. And that's more and more the, uh, what we'll see in medical science in the future. By manipulating holograms, by manipulating uh, a mouse thousands of distances away, something happens on the other spot. But I can imagine as well that uh, we will have entirely different classrooms over time. We have kind of holograms sitting over there, students that are sitting in New York for example, and for us it looks as if they were on these seats. And I can really look into their eyes and then know that I am looking to them and expect an answer from them. Is it making you dizzy? It sounds weird, but uh, try to think how a mobile phone sounds to someone who was born in 1900. That you just can be connected on every spot on earth with a device that costs you less than 30 euro. By then it was really unimaginable as well. Um, that for internet too. A Wi-Fi network. I started by telling you watch out with not Wi-Fi because it's most of the time sorry open. It's not encrypted. And you can just take it out from here. I mean if you want to hack a cable, at least you have to have access to that cable. And maybe I have to make a hole in the wall there to plug in my computer to that cable. With a wireless connection it's much easier. I can just grab it from the air, that information. Um, and all the time, information nowadays is sent partly over wires, partly over wireless connections, partly over satellite connections, back to wires and so on. And actually you don't know which path is used. And can you know? No, you can't know. 
because it's in the core of the internet infrastructure that we do not want to worry about the path. That's what I explained to you at the beginning of this class. That was explicitly the intention not to have, not having to worry about the path to follow. Then a little bit so that you have heard about it. <clears throat> What's hypertext? Hypertext is nothing more than a protocol that makes it possible to link from one document, from one picture to another. It's what you see in your browser. Most of the time we make use of the hypertext protocol, the HTTP. And it gives you the possibility not just to show text, but to show what is bold, what is italic, what is blue, what is red, what is on the left hand side and what is on the right hand side, to enrich, in other words, your documents. That's what you do actually with HTTP. It's making up uh, your text or your information that you want to send. You do it via HTML. HTML is the coding system. HTTP is the transfer protocol. They go hand in hand with each other. And for who is familiar with HTML? HTML shows you, uh, tells the laptop how information has to be shown. HTML says, for example, that this is a hyperlink and this has to be at the bottom, and this is a footnote, and this is uh, meta information, and so on. Maybe I can give you an example. Let's go to the website of the HZ. It looks like this. Now, what's the HTML page behind? Um, that looks like this. That's HTML. And I give you just one example. Um, here, the title tag. HZ University of Applied Sciences, hyphen, the Persoonlijke Hogeschool, and title. Because of this text between the opening and the closing tag title, in the HTML page, the browser, in this example, the internet browser, knows that that text has to be written here. You see? There on top. If an other text would be in the HTML page, something else would be shown there. And so the representation of the whole page that you see here is built up. Picture, a picture, a picture, a picture, bold, um, tweets, a button, uh, a banner. All this is defined in HTML and can be understood by the browser. And can be sent over from one computer, the server, the web server in this case, to the laptop of mine over the HTTP protocol. So you could say HTML is a designer, is a sculpture of your message, and HTTP is the, is the postman, is the deliverer. Back to the slideshow. The richer the information gets, the more we want to describe the significance of the information. Now, this might sound very cryptic. I give an example. What's blue, white, red? If I send over blue, white, red, what do you want to see on your net on your laptop? Does blue, white, red? Uh, well, blue, white, red has an additional meaning to you. What 
means black, yellow, red to you? Less than means for you probably. Excuse me? Less than it means for you probably. Belgian flag. Uh, Bel <laughs> the Belgian flag. And blue, white, red. Dutch flag upside down. French. It can be in vertical bars, then it's the French. In horizontal bars, then it's the Dutch flag. Well, this additional information can be stored in XML. So that if you send over that information, that the laptop knows, ah, oh, there's a flag. I have to project, I had to display here the Belgian or the Dutch or the French flag. And that's just an example about additional significance that you can give to words. Blue, white, red in that case is not just three colors, it's the French flag. And that's what can be defined in XML. A number can be a student number, can be a bank account number, can be a telephone number. What number it is can be defined in the XML. Now what you need to know about web servers and web and, uh, and clients is that they play the same game over and over and over and over again. One is sending a request to the other and the other is sending a response. So it means if I on this laptop <coughs> type in in the address bar HTTP column slash slash www dot cnn dot com I send a request from my laptop to the web server of CNN and the response of the web server of CNN will be the home page of the CNN website and then on the CNN website I might launch a search and that search again is a request that goes to the web server of CNN they look up which pages or which articles match my search and they give me a list that's the response of all the articles that match my search and this game can go on and on and on the same if I google something I go to the search engine of Google and Google gives me a response it can go the other way around as well if you're banking for example the payment server of the bank might send you a request for a security code that you have to calculate with that special calculator, you know what I mean? So then the request is sent from the payment server to your laptop and you send the response by doing the calculation on that small device you key in the number and you send the response to the payment server and that game or that process of requesting and responding it takes place millions and millions of times in the communication between two machines and be it your laptop or be it your phone it doesn't matter or be it your iPad keep that in mind that's the idea behind clients and servers but both can be the sender of a request or the sender of a response so it's not that the server always is sending the requests and the laptop is always sending the response it can be the other way around as well